Welcome to SRT Prosthetics Amputee Academy. In this video, we discuss community reintegration for patients living with limb loss. You can see timestamps listed in the course description so that you can fast forward to any specific topic you are looking for. All right, we are good to go. So for any of you um, who have never experienced one of SRT's community reintegration topics, um, we want to sincerely welcome you and thank you so much for joining this. Um, my name is Theron. I work with SRT, Prosthetics and Orthotics. We're a company that was founded in 2002 um, in the Northeast Indiana, Northwest Ohio region. Moved into the um, Indianapolis, Kokomo region. Then we also have offices in Illinois and Wisconsin as well. Um, this is part of our education program where we focus on community reintegration topics for both lower and upper extremity amputee patients. I'm gonna go around the room and call on all of our panelists to do a very brief introduction of themselves and kind of what their role is either with the company or for our patient um, panelists. If you could just tell us your name, where you're from, um, and your amputation level, and then we'll learn more about you as we um, kind of go through the different topics. So I'm just going to go as I see you on my screen. Brooke, if you'd like to go first, that'd be fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. I am Brooke um, Osteen. I'm an occupational therapist that works full-time for SRT prosthetics and orthotics. Um, so my primary role is the upper limb patient population um, but seeing as we see the patient as a whole person and treat the whole person, I get to be Renee's sidekick um, and come up with maybe some tips and tricks for donning and doffing um, or just thinking about some of those activities of daily living um, scenarios. So we do a lot of interdisciplinary care. Um, so I'm, I'm the sidekick tonight and it's so much fun. Um, so just kind of bringing that OT perspective um, to kind of a lower extremity topic. Perfect. Uh, Renee, you are next. Hi, I'm Renee. I'm a physical therapist and I also work for SRT. My primary role is probably education, um, but I also uh, help with patients and consult as much as possible. And when people have some questions or kind of want the PT perspective, I'll help out as I'm able to. And I also try to connect patients with physical therapists whom they can see for, uh, for regular therapy as they're improving. Perfect. Leslie Hovarder. Hello, everybody. I am Leslie Hovarder. I've been with SRT since 2016, and I started out as a PCC. And then two years ago, they asked if I wanted to do marketing, community relations, and I said, sure. So I've been doing that ever since in the Wisconsin and Illinois market. Excellent. Our patient panelists include Chris Ewing. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chris Ewing. I am a below the new knee amputee. I have um, been with SRT since 2018 as far as a, on a patient profile when I got my amputation. Perfect. And then our next panelist is Lori. Hello, I'm Lori Faust. Um, I've been an amputee right above the knee since January of 2020. Um, yeah, I'm kind of new at this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And then mm -hmm. our final panelist is, who also works with SRT is Mark White. Hey guys, I'm Mark. I'm the, as well as a patient of SRT, I am the patient liaison. So my role at SRT is um, primarily uh, being that um, mentor to our new patients who are brand new to the process, um, as well as a resource for our clinicians. Um, so I can help bridge the gap between what the patient is experiencing uh, in the room, um, at therapy, wherever it be, and kind of helping the, our clinical staff just achieve better outcomes overall. And Perfect. I'm a below, below the knee amputee myself. 
Perfect. Thank you guys so much. So um, if you're joining this via YouTube after we have posted, you can actually see in our archives, we did a very similar panel discussion on driving that you can check out there. Um, but today we are going to be talking primarily about shopping. Um, and we have one rule with our panelists, as I'll be calling on people kind of throughout, is that we're not necessarily looking for the best case scenario here, right? You know, we live in the real world like everybody else does. And so what we're going to be talking about are tips and tricks that we've received from patients and therapists, and then also things that Brooke and Renee have been teaching for a long time. Um, and so as we kind of go through these discussions, we're going to be talking about a lot of real life stuff and not only talking about the challenges that patients with limb loss face, but embracing them and really talking about how can these be over, how these can be achieved. And then hoping that if you are watching this on YouTube, you are able to put in the comments your own suggestions. Um, so really want to thank everybody for participating because I think this definitely helps a lot of people in the future. I'm going to be kind of managing, um, we do have a PowerPoint that's associated with this, but I'm going to be kind of bouncing in and out um, just so that we can, everyone can see each other's faces and such, um, but it kind of just keeps us on track. And then there's also really good visual aids with that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And then Renee, I'm going to have you kind of get started as we talk about shopping carts. Okay. So um, for all of you viewing, we've, uh, we've talked to our panelists about just saying it like it is. And uh, if, there are, uh, if there are tips that they know that, that we don't know, then uh, that's why we're calling it a panel discussion. So I, I think for Brooke and myself, both of us have several years of experience working with patients with amputations, but we're not amputees. So we learn by going and by listening to patients. And we every day, I think we're both learning something new from people about things that they've tried. So, so once you get yourself in the door, <laughs> um, again, if you want to learn more about how to get to the store, that's the other panel discussion that we had about driving. So you got to get a cart. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, that's kind of the first thing. So I really like this particular picture. How many of you have had this situation where you pull and you pull and you pull and the carts are inextricably linked to each other. <clears throat> and it takes some kind of, you know, magical act to get them separated. So the, in this particular picture, <clears throat> we see, uh, we see a potential problem. This is all potentially a fall risk, right? So especially for someone with a prosthetic knee that is even harder to control, um, that, can, that can be an issue for folks. So, uh, so a couple of tips that, um, that we've come up with is, you know, this is kind of a no brainer, try to grab a cart that is not attached to another one. <laughs> Don't we, we should all be doing that. Let's be honest. I will say too, one of the things I do, um, with my two legs is I get a cart from one of the cart corrals in the parking lot and go in with it simply because I like the little carts and you can hardly ever find them in the store. Um, but so that's a tip that, um, that just popped in my head is that maybe, uh, maybe because the parking lot's uneven, you're coming into the store already pushing a cart and that gives you a little bit of, um, of balance. I don't like, uh, the way that this, um, this patient is stepping backwards. <clears throat> um, obviously he's able-bodied really fit and, um, and uh, is, has had his amputation for a while, uh, but that's still not a recommended method. So I would, I would want a sideways approach, right? So you're standing on the side. If it was in this scenario where you have these carts attached to each other, if you can, the store where I shop, it's not always possible to get to the side, but if you can get to the side and then you've got a little bit more um, purchase, I think, to step sideways and then you can lift up the part that flips up that might make the carts hook together. Um, so that allows you to uh, maybe to free it up with a sidestepping motion instead of, instead of stepping backward. And then we had a discussion earlier about using a cart instead of one of those handheld baskets, simply because you never know how much you're going to get. Um, so I'll, I'll pitch this one to our panelists and have you all chime in about your experiences with cart management. I will say that when I 
first got my ampu or my prosthetic. I'm sorry. And the first couple times that I went into the store, I was clutching onto the cart. Um, my balance wasn't the best. I all of us who have a new prosthetic knows what that kind of feels like and how unsure you are. And I was actually holding on to the cart and I was too close to the cart handle. And when my stride would go up, I hit the very front of that cart and almost tripped myself a couple times until I figured out that my arms were way too close to that. Uh, or on the handle and I, all I needed to do was really back it up and elongate my arm. So that would be something that I would encourage you not to do is not get so up on that shopping cart that you're not going to feel that uh, your spacing um, and your gait when you're walking to hit that and trip yourself because I did that a couple, two or three times, and it took me a while to go back to the store because I was so concerned that I was going to fall in the middle of Myers. And then I figured out that, hey, I just got to back it up and I've got to be back here to um, compensate mm -hmm. for my gate, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my story on the old shopping cart deal. <laughs> I did the exact thing. Oops. Oh, Lori, is that you trying to chime in? Yeah, she is. I just think we've got a little. Oh, I just, I was just agreeing. I, I did the same thing. I, I kicked the, I kicked the tire of the shopping cart, the, or the wheel. Yeah. Because I was so close to it. Of course, I couldn't feel it until after I tripped, you know. Uh -huh. So back up, back up. <laughs> Have you ever had any issues actually getting a cart or does that seem to be okay? No, that's been okay. There's the, where I generally shop, there's, there's space to do that. And I stand off to the side and, and if there's one that I have to fight with, I just get another one. That's me. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't fight with it anymore. No, I find no. a freestanding. <laughs> yeah, some place I can get. I'm not fighting with it either, Lori. Yeah, I think that's a good thing for all of us. Mark, do you have any insight? Well, you kind of stole my insight, Renee. So, um, <laughs> I was just gonna say that early on, that was kind of my game plan. Was I would get one from out in the parking lot that was just kind of free. And I just kind of used it as practice just to walk on something I wasn't used to um, because that's starting out. That's what I did. Um, my wife and I would go to the store and I would push the cart and she would pick the groceries up and put them in there. So I just followed her around. I'm sure she didn't mind, but it was also just, I got out and I walked around with some extra, extra support. So um, I really liked that at the beginning it's it is a glorified walker right in certain ways and I think in that situation that's kind of helpful um it feels it, it kind of can be a sense of protection as well when somebody you know if, if it's if the store is crowded um so I yeah I don't have a problem with that at all my as a PT when I start to get concerned is when people are you know, several years out and they're still using that. Right. Or and for me, it's, you know, it's a lot of patients who aren't amputees, but maybe they had a total knee surgery and it takes them a long time to trust their knee. Um, and I just want them to just stick your neck out a little bit. It'll be okay. Uh, but I completely understand the fear of falling. Did so. Yeah. Go ahead. Did any of you guys find that the first time that you went, like you adjusted your time, right? So like, I'm like a Saturday 8am shopper with my husband, like knowing that it was your first time going to the grocery store. Did, did you like strategically plan it and be like, Oh, I'm going to go at like noon on a Tuesday because I know it's, it's not busy. So did, did any of the three of you find that you adjusted the time that you went the first time? I did not. And I wished I would have. Because yeah, I didn't either. 
I, I, I wanted to kind of prove to myself that I could do it by myself, if you will. So I never really thought about how busy the store would be. And so I went on a Saturday morning and it was a mess. And so I ended up not making it through the entire store and just kind of giving up and going to pay and thinking, well, that wasn't the smartest thing that I've done <laughs> lately. So then I, if we're going to talk about this later, I, I, I'm going to say that now I do grocery shop on, and I have that luxury because I'm retired, but I grocery shop on non-busy midday. So I don't have to really deal with a, a crowded place. Um, not that I am frightened to do it because I'm not anymore. It just, it makes my life easier and it may make somebody who is behind me easier if they think I'm not hurrying along fast enough. So, mm -hmm. um, so I just had, but I did Brooke and I should have. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lori, uh, remember your, yeah. secret, your secret weapon. We need to, uh, we need to go ahead and, and let everybody know. <laughs> oh, I have a, I have an 11 year old grandson who likes to shop with me and likes to be helpful. So if I have heavy shopping to do, I take him with me. And, and my husband, my husband is always helpful to go to, but if, if I can, I take my grandson just because he loves to do it. So, and he's very, all right. when he goes right. with you, do you push the cart or does he push the cart? I push, he, he gets things off the shelf for me. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Before I transition into the next slide, I just want to know how these husbands have managed to still be allowed to go grocery <laughs> shopping because that ship sailed long ago for me. Yeah. <laughs> we we spend a lot more I would goes. really <laughs> rather have Dale go than me go. And he does <laughs> go quite a bit on the way home. And stuff. I love the <laughs> pandemic where we went and picked up groceries. I thought that was great. <laughs> Remember, Theron, I was only there pushing the cart. I wasn't picking anything out. Well, you see, I'm still a cart like rider where like you run, 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 run and zoom, and I'm no longer <laughs> permitted in the stores. So you have to stay home. I have to stay home. <laughs> All right, Renee, the floor is yours. To go? What's that? Does she allow the kids to go? Oh yeah, they're behaved. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, I think I think the the take home message though that I would that I would let you all think about is asking for help, and and I I completely understand that feeling of I want to do it myself. I want to make sure that I can do it. That's absolutely understandable. Um, early on, ask for help. If you, if you have somebody who can help you, I also thought about the, you know, the wonderful, you know, one of the things that COVID taught us was the, um, the click it, uh, mm -hmm. it people who honestly, you know, Brooke and I have talked about how they just run over you now in the grocery store with their <laughs> as the people who are like filling the orders, which is another, another scary thing now for, uh, um, for <laughs> walking in the grocery store, um, uh, but yeah, but, you know, having some, you know, calling ahead or having somebody load your groceries, the tricky part is you got to be able to get them out when you get home. So uh, and if you don't have help at the store, but you have somebody at home, that's great. Or if you're at the store by yourself, those, those baggers will help you out to your car. Mm -hmm. I very rarely do people ask for that kind of help. I will say that in the grocery store that I'm at, there is. If they notice that I do have a prosthetic, the cashier will always say, do you need help out? Mm -hmm. Which is really, I have nine times out of 10, they will ask me if they can see my, my prosthetic, mm -hmm. so, which is wonderful. That is nice. Yeah. Okay. So more about the cart. Um, if you look at this middle picture, 
you'll see what uh, what Chris and Lori were talking about and how easy it would be to kick the wheel of the cart or the shelf underneath the cart. So, uh, so that was what Chris was talking about related to making sure that your that your elbows you're not extended all the way right that's a little excessive but maybe your elbows are bent a little but stay upright if the cart is close to you you're also going to tend to bend over more when you're you know you're going to have the t-rex thing going on with your arms and then uh that changes how you walk so it might decrease the ability of your prosthetic foot and or your prosthetic knee to function as they're made to function if you're all hunched over. So learning to be upright, um, I will tell all of the people with whom I work to lead with their belly button. So the tendency for folks learning to use a prosthetic leg is that they're going to lead with their chest, right? So their, their upper body is forward. Um, and, and I want them to be nice and upright because if you're leading with your belly button, then the prosthetic leg is going to work the way that it should work. It takes confidence and practice for sure. Um, but that's, that's what she was talking about. Um, I really like the picture on the left too. <clears throat> so one thing that everyone should be practicing, and if you're in, in physical therapy or occupational therapy and they're not practicing this with you, ask them to help you with it. You're, you, can, you can let them know what you want to work on. And that is sidestepping. So, and, and sidestepping, everybody can step to their sound side, but stepping to the prosthetic side is a little nerve wracking. So I would challenge you to practice stepping to your sound side. If you've got a hallway, you could do that. Even you can even practice this with crutches or a cane. That's there's nothing wrong with that. Honestly, I've, I've had people do it in the clinic with a, with a walker. So it's a little awkward. You take a step and move the walker, take a step and move the walker, but at least you're getting a sense of what that feels like. So stepping to your, your sound side, feel what your hip is doing and then try to make your other hip do the same thing when you go in the other direction. And that exercise, I promise you will also help you walking forward because it gets your hips stronger, but then it gives you this confidence to navigate a narrow, you know, some kind of narrow path. And, uh, and you're picking your feet up rather than, rather than pivoting. Um, this particular picture on the right, also you get the impression that, that you could pivot or spin, um, on your intact leg and just never really put your prosthetic foot down until you're all the way around when you're turning practice turning. That's a huge thing you can practice at home. And also you can practice in therapy that will certainly help you in the grocery store. So imagine you're pushing your cart down an aisle, you stop, uh, whatever can of beans you want is on the four shelf up. Instead of moving your feet, you just turn your upper body and reach and get the, get the, um, the can. Sometimes that's okay, but it's really better for your body, including your low back to pick your feet up, turn your feet and then turn your feet back instead of twisting your upper body. Um, a great conversation to have with your prosthetist too, about the components that you have, the knee or the foot that you have and whether or not it can handle a little bit of rotation. So uh, Brooke, do you have anything to add to that too? Sorry, he unshared. And then I was like, where'd my screen go? <laughs> um, <laughs> I got lost in my own screen. Um, I would just say, like, I think we've talked, you know, like you talked about navigating and those tight turns um, and those, those click list people, right. I'm totally going to pick on Kroger. Cause that's what I know it as. Um, I would say Chris, Lori, or Mark, have you had a situation where, you know, you're trying to navigate something and maybe it's just like a tighter space than what was normal prior to your amputation. Like, have you had like 
a scenario, like, I think we just assume people can be jerks sometimes. Like, have you had that scenario where maybe somebody didn't realize you were an amputee and like, just didn't get out of your way? Or have you ever had this situation where you've had to politely say, excuse me, like, I, you know, I need a little bit more space. Has that, or how did, if it's happened, how did you broach that? I, um, have it in the clearance aisle at Target. They have, I, they have rows and rows of clearance and you can't really see around the corner. So there's not that much reaction time. And I know Mark and I talked about how important reaction time is. Also, there are feet that stick out of the clothes rack. And so you're trying to maneuver in a place, not get in anybody else's space. And there you really do have to know how to sidestep in some of those clothing stores, especially the way that they have them racked up. And also not only the people, but also those feet that tend to stick out that you have to be aware of too. Um, In Target, this has been quite a while ago. A lady and I were looking at in the clearance item and wasn't much space. And she, she was kind of moving quickly where I wasn't. And there was really not enough room to, to go any place. And she was a little bit up, I don't, uptight. I don't know if that's a good word. <laughs> But all I had to do was turn around and she saw my leg and she kind of went the other way. So sometimes if they just see the leg, they're kind of know that maybe you can't move along as quickly and so on. So that would be where I have been, especially that comes to mind is in between those clearance racks at Target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say more so in the clothing area where maybe space is obviously confined and then someone's not really looking all the way up and down. So they don't maybe they just don't look down and see your name T or you're wearing pants or something like that to where it's where you would normally kind of turn to the side to like shimmy past each other. So um, and those real narrow and like Chris said, those clothing racks have feet that stick out. So something you have to be mindful of at our at our Kroger we have some end caps that are baskets full of things uh, near the dairy case Mm. so it's not really convenient to take the cart in between the dairy case and the end cap because then you can't open the door and when you're vertically challenged anyway um, you can't really open the door reach up hold onto the cart and do everything all at the same time. So that that's that poses a, a difficulty. Um, you know that I'm glad you said that. That makes me think about also opening a door, like the dairy case, right? Opening a door with one hand, having to reach with the other hand, taking a step forward or backward. Um, and then, you know, a gallon of milk is not light. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. That's really good. So for that situation, again, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm sure Brooke is thinking the same thing. What a great thing to practice in therapy. Mm -hmm. What a great thing to practice when somebody is there and it's a safer environment for you and you can play with where does my body weight go? Um, Typically you would want your, your forward leg to be your intact leg. And you're, you can have the toe of your prosthesis behind you to reach forward. Um, but that, you know, I love, this is where core strength comes in. So I think a lot of PTs start working with someone with an amputation and they think about let's walk, let's walk. And honestly, that's what I like to do too, is help people walk, but core exercises, help you tremendously with that kind of balance. So I, that's really great. And then I mentioned at the beginning too, about using art as a defense. 
just in case. So, you know, even if you think you're going to buy three things, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. (laughs) Anything else on that topic? We good? All right. So we're going to transition out of the shopping cart world and go into the aisle way in the shelves. So I'll share my screen again. And Renee, I'll have you kind of kickstart us off again on, on a new topic. So uh, similar to what we were just talking about related to opening doors, um, using a stagger. So in this particular picture, um, our, our buddy who um, is our fabulous model for this one was a little on the tall side. So uh, <laughs> didn't really didn't really help illustrate our point about how to reach. Um, but, you know, I've treated many, many, many people in my career with low back pain and honestly reaching up and down is something we cover with those folks too. So your body mechanics are really important. So he is able to reach on the top shelf. You know, I, I haven't done that probably ever. Uh, and he didn't really stagger his feet either. And my guess is in this picture, you can't see what his right hand is doing. He's probably holding onto a shelf. So there's he's that. probably holding onto the shelf in the other aisle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so thinking about, about coming forward, stabilizing, being able to reach, but engaging your core, you've got your your feet staggered intact leg forward, um, depending on your comfort level with your, um, with your prosthesis, um, you know, asking for help <laughs> is better than a fall for sure. Um, and then, uh, um, Chris, do you want to talk about carrying your reacher? I thought that was, well, like- yeah. Um, it, <laughs> I think that sometimes I am a little too bold and aggressive and I forget which sometimes is a good thing that I have a prosthetic and it was just last week that I could not get laundry detergent off of the top shelf so I was going to climb it not even thinking because I and then I get to the place where I'm thinking not such a good idea so I've decided that I'm going to try to get it with another thing of another detergent to try to knock it down and then this lovely little gal came over and said can I help you and I said oh yes please thank you so you know that's really the wrong approach to do but sometimes we go back free prosthetic and forget that hey that's not the safest way to do it so what I can tell you is I used to take a pulled up grabber thing um, and you can get them just about every place every place. And I actually keep it in my kitchen for the cupboards too, because I am not what you would call very tall at all. And (laughs) so I do have that issue. Um, And my husband really doesn't like me to be up on the step stool or ladder, which I have been known to do too. So, but that, that grab thing really does come in handy and they have it to where you can pull it up and actually put it in your your purse, just like the fold up canes and stuff, if you would need them. So those really are really quite handy for, for just mm-hmm. things or just go get somebody that, I mean, that's a pretty easy fix as well. So mm-hmm. now that I've told you all my bad habits, D- don't do what she does. I don't think- do what you know. I'm telling you, take the grabber thing or go ask for help. That's, right. that's what I'm That's telling right. you to do. I'm, try- I'm yeah. trying to keep you from doing the things that I have thought about doing. <laughs> Normally, it's me saying that during these, so I'm glad it's someone else this time. That's true. That yeah. So, Mark, do you find yourself doing things like that that you don't really think about it until it's almost too late? Or after I've done it, and I'm like, that okay. probably wasn't the best idea. <laughs> I, I get you. I get you. I just think that um, one of the things that I think is worth noting is that I did not get my prosthetic until I was older. I mean, I was 56 and was 57 when I had my amputation. So 
I've got all those years prior of, of doing that, of doing the things that just came natural. And now I'm back to the place where my prostate, which is a good thing. My prosthetic is very natural for me. So I don't think in terms sometimes that I need to think yet. I, and I hope that comment is helpful as well, because I think you do find yourself going, doing something that isn't necessarily safe to do. And then, you know, I, I do catch myself going, hey, I, you know, I need to think about the consequences when I do things that maybe aren't as safe. Hey, Lori, as an above knee, yeah. do you find that you're still, and you're newer, right? You even said, I'm new to this. Do you still find, mm-hmm. you think, oh my goodness, I have to think about how does my knee lock and unlock if I'm going to reach up high on the shelf or where do my feet have to, you know, be positioned? Or do you find that like, I mean, you're, you're just over a year out. Do you feel like that's gone away or do you still do that a lot? I, I still think about, I think about it a lot. If I have to reach up, I generally lift my prosthetic side up and, and lean more on to my sound leg just because I feel more secure. And then I, I, then I have to think about when I put my foot back down, you know, how's that going to, how's that going to happen? So, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't try to reach over my head very far without really thinking about it. Do you feel like it's gotten like faster and better or do you still feel like you still? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, but I have to consciously remind myself, okay, think about this. I, you know, like, like, like Chris said, you become, you become so used to how you used to do things Mm -hmm. and you can't, you can't necessarily do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it's so So. interesting though that, that it gets better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's better quickly. Yeah. And where you are now is where Chris was a couple years ago. So yeah. Oh yeah. I can't, I can't, um, I, if we would have had this conversation two years ago, I probably would have been in the corner stuck of my thumb someplace going, Oh no, I would never do that. But it, uh-huh. it does. It does but Chris, don't, before I switch over to the next slide, don't worry. I have seen it, Therapists have a universal smile, and I've seen Brooke and Renee do it a million times. When they hear a patient say a bad habit, they make this face. (laughs) (laughs) It's this, okay, I don't want to insult you, but that's terrifying. Don't do that ever again. (laughs) You know, it's truthful, though, because I would bet that a John of us do that, and I'm, I'm yeah. I would like to just let people know out there that this isn't the way to do it, but you might think about it and just remember me saying, no, don't do it. Like yeah. this. So Chris, if I saw oh. you in the store, I might take that reacher and, and like, and I'm really get me with it. No, I, I'm I, have, not play, it. I might have to play whack-a-mole with it and be like, what are you even thinking right now? <laughs> You who well, I can like, tell you girls that I will never try to climb the shelf again because I will always see you in Renee's faces there if I oh. even think about it. Chris, Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm just letting you know, sister, I know where you live and we're gonna have <laughs> a GPS on you, and people are gonna alert us when you're at the store. <laughs> Because I'm going to come across the new story of uh, Chris was in the grocery store and knocked over all the cocoa pumps in aisle 12 because she tried to climb the shelf. No more, girlfriend. Now, I will, no probably, I will probably jinx myself when I say this, but as an amputee, I have never fallen yet. And I have that real fear of falling. Wow. I have never, I have real. never fallen. Wow. Ever. That, yeah, and that's a and Lori knows that's a legit fear. That it is, it is a legit fear for me. Um, yeah, and so I really, that's why I think about when when I do something that is not relatively smart. I think, oh, but I don't want to fall. Maybe that's what keeps me. Mm-hmm. So. That there's a real there's a balance between the kind of effort that keeps you independent and mobile which is what you want and something that's unsafe. 
So, and, and you're the only one who can decide that for yourself too, you know, so I can, you know, as a therapist, I've got my ideas, but each person needs to seek that where that balance is um, out for themselves. So, and listen to your therapist because you guys know who my <laughs> therapist was and she yes. and I are great, great friends. And I do hear her, even though she's not, but 20 miles away chirping in my subconscious going, really? I, yeah. <laughs> I can, I can hear. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So moving on to, uh, to low shelves, right. And picking up things that are, that are low or heavy. And this is a place that honestly, for low back pain patients, I spent years teaching people how to lift properly. Uh, and now, you know, now you throw in a prosthesis and it, and it's tricky. So the number one thing I tell a, a low back pain patient to do is, is to stick your butt out, which in this picture, our buddy is doing in both of these situations. So what honestly, what you often hear is when you're trying to lift something is lift with your legs and you're thinking that I only have one leg. And the reality is you lift mostly with your butt. <laughs> so, so you bend your knees, but you don't need to bend your knees very far in order to get down to pick something up, look at how low he can reach just by flexing his hips. So his knees bent, sure. I mean, he's got, you know probably seventy five percent of his body weight in the picture on the left on his on his right leg, maybe twenty five percent on the prosthetic leg. This particular leg um, probably has got, is in a resistance mode when he's in that particular, uh, position. So again, talk to your prosthetist about your knee. If you have a prosthetic knee, it's characteristics and, and what you need to be able to do to get it, to give you resistance and be stiff when you're trying to bend over and, and pick something up. Now he's got very long arms, of course, <clears throat> which match his long legs. Uh, but, but if you're a little shorter, then you're closer to the ground, right? So, so this posture, it's, it's a squat uh, that's more of a hip squat than knees. So think about a, um, a lineman in football. So an offensive lineman, think about the position that that person is in at the line before the snap of the football. And it's mostly hip and a little bit of knee. So, uh, so that gives you, it also allows you to generate more power in your, um, in your intact leg and then up the chain in your amputated side. So then the golfer's lift is something that's, that's noted in this slide. The golfer's lift is when you, you reach forward with one hand, your back leg lifts up from the ground a little bit. So essentially your body goes like this on that pivot point, what's nice is that you could be holding on to the cart with one hand for balance when you do that. So just look at, it's called the golfer's lift because that's how golfers will, will um, pick up their golf ball. So that works uh, for a lot of people. Again, I teach people to do that with low back pain. <clears throat> um, in this picture, we have him taking the, the case of water and instead of trying to pick it up and lift it up over, the edge of the car to get it into the cart, he just can slide it almost sideways onto that bottom rack. So uh, don't forget uh, that there's a bottom rack. And I think when you're going through the checkout, um, they can probably scan that um, in some way without you having to, uh, to lift it up or somebody can, can help you. And then, as I mentioned before, use the cart for balance. Um, if you're taking something off a shelf that's equal with a cart, well, goodness, just go ahead and, and put it in a cart. Um, but, they, but you have some options there for sure. Um, so Brooke, do you have anything you want to chime in on there? No, I just have questions. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, my question would be ladies, is there, or Mark, is there a situation where like, if you're by at the store by yourself, like you just don't pick something up. Like you're like, Oh, I can't get that by myself. Or Lori, do you call in the secret weapon? If you know, you have yeah. to get a case. Of I don't water? do. Yeah. I don't do cat litter by myself or, so, or a case of water. No, that's too heavy and too awkward. So only if the secret that's weapon good. is with you. <clears throat> 
Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I kind of do, do the opposite of what the gentleman does, is he goes floor level to uh, beneath. I do a pie into the cart. Mm -hmm. um, I find that easier for me. And that way I, I can get um, like the water and the cap and <clears throat> stuff. So, but I, I do it where it's parallel to the top of the. That's smart. Uh, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I'll agree with Chris. I'd much rather pick something up and then stand all the way up and put it in the cart than pick something up and try to get it on that lower rack. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, like in that picture, he probably had to take a couple steps either when he was fully standing up or squatted over. I mean, what you don't think about is, mm -hmm. is can be difficult to do. Um, mm -hmm. and then also thinking about something heavy is where am I putting that on the cart? If I put it in the front of that rack, it makes the cart harder to turn. I've got to use more energy. Mm -hmm what and how I'm standing to turn the cart. So I always try to put the heavy stuff towards the back to where it makes it easier to turn. Said the engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I had a big argument about that with my wife. She's like, why do you keep doing that? Well, push this cart around with all, everything up front. She's like, no, okay. it's that's true. Well, and okay, yeah, you're right. And anything that you put in there, you probably at some point have to get back out. So, yeah, uh -huh. that's fair. I have much worse balance the lower I go. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, when I have tried to pick something that is heavy up, uh, I, I really have like hit my head on the shopping cart, you know, <laughs> trying to, which is not really all that great. So I just kind of stop that noise when I'm by myself. And just like Mark, I, I put it in the actual cart because I don't have I don't have really good balance down low. I don't mm -hmm. know whether it's something that I'm doing wrong or it. I just don't know. I don't feel comfortable going that low. I just don't have. It doesn't seem like to me the balance that mm -hmm. maybe I should have or. I, it requires I, I it requires strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris, I'm telling you, GPS tracker. <laughs> She's going to end I'm up. I'm not like saying I do it. That's why I do it over the top now and don't go down. Don't go down that low. Anymore. She's going to end up with a concussion from whacking her head. Oh, on no, the I'm not because I don't do it anymore. That's but right. I, She's learned. She's I learned. I learned. I learned. <laughs> Chris, what you're going to find out here in the next like two minutes is that this is actually an intervention it has nothing to do <laughs> with community reintegration. Like it's recorded for a completely different reason. It's more of a liability for us. <laughs> oh, so, wait, this is going to be, this is going to be titled what not to do. <laughs> yes, there you go. There you go. You can't have an after without a before. <laughs> and, you're absolutely correct there. <laughs> anything else um in the low shelf world brooke did you get your questions asked i did sorry inquiring minds no problem oh no, you're good all right renee you good yep all right so we'll keep going kind of in the same world Here we go. So this is the miscellaneous uh slide so thinking about the other things that we might encounter, I appreciate that earlier um, Chris and Mark talked about um, clothes shopping, which I, I hadn't even thought about those feet sticking out. Uh, and then if you look on the in the left side picture, obviously the, the extent of the shelves on the top matches the extent of the shelves on the bottom. So if you're not really in tune to where your foot is, it would be easy to kick that lower shelf as well. So here he is carrying uh, something that's heavy and floppy, right? A bag of dog food. Um, I can't tell you how many low back pain patients I had who hurt themselves picking up a bag of dog food. So, um, so this, I mean, to me, this kind of goes together. So many tips that work for, for those folks uh, 
also help folks with limb loss. So um, if your hands are full, um, that's, that's going to potentially change your balance. If you're holding one thing, like in this case, if he just had the, the bag of, of dog food and he, you know, he, and that's all he needed to buy, you want that close to you. So you're going to carry that like you're carrying a baby um, because it will improve your, um, it decreases the energy that it takes to carry it. Maybe if you can hold it with one arm, then you can, um, then you can, you know, reach with your other hand for balance or something. Again, that's where I'd say if you're getting a bag of dog food or cat food, um, get a cart or like Lori says, have some, have your secret weapon, go shopping with you. <clears throat> so this also, uh, the slide also addresses carrying a child. And we think that that is probably its own topic entirely. I think that uh, we could probably get together a group of, of folks with amputations to talk for a long time about carrying their kids. Um, but I think we've got, um, we've got people here who can at least speak to that. Uh, so, uh, so who wants to chime in about, about what that's like if you're, you know, if you're trying to carry a little person? Well, I think you, uh, you hit it the nail on the head, it's heavy and it's a floppy thing. <laughs> um, so I always carry one of either, and I've carried both kids at once. Um, I don't do it very often because it's, it takes up both of my arms if I do need to grab something. Um, so I usually carry one, um, on the same side as my amputation, that's kind of how I carry anything that's heavy that requires more balance and more effort to walk. Um, like we have a, a seven gallon gas can that I have to fill up for a lawnmower. So seven gallons of gasoline is pretty heavy when you pick it up to put it in the back of a truck and then carry it out to your shed. So I always carry that on my, my prosthetic side. Otherwise it throws off my balance significantly. I think that's such a great tip. I don't know um, that the average soul with a new prosthetic leg would think about that. I mean, my guess is your, your, in, your initial attempt would be to carry it on your other side, on your intact mm -hmm. side. It was for me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to carry it on my um, real side, if you will, mm -hmm. for the longest time. And I actually have to walk up two steps to get into our house. And I was like, I literally was leaning and caught myself leaning over to that side. And when I figured it out that I could take a lighter thing of groceries on my regular side and I could carry three or four bags up my arm on my prosthetic side. And I had no idea that that was really the way I needed to do it. But once I learned that, then it, it became much easier to carry in certain things out of mm -hmm. the car. Mm -hmm. Lori, you have some input on this one? Um, I, I carry on my prosthetic side. That's just easier. I don't want Did we lose you, Lori? She's there. Oh, no. She'll come back on. There we go. <clears throat> Do you see her and I don't? No, but I, I know that she's coming back on. Okay, gotcha. Um, as we... Well, there she is. There she is. Yeah, you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know what happened. It just said reconnecting. So um, I'm left-handed, so I want to carry on my left side, but obviously that's not the best way. It's just best to do it on the prosthetic side, which is my right side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's handedness is important too because that's that really affects people. When I've trained people to use a cane, a unilateral assistive device. Um, everybody wants to use it on their, in their dominant hand. 
Um, and that's not always the best way to do it. So, uh, so that's worth, I think for, for me, the take home message is for everybody listening to try, try both ways and not in a high stakes situation, you know, don't try this with your new baby, <laughs> <laughs> um, but try practice, you know, in a safe environment, um, no carpet. If you can find a place where you're, you know, trying to carry, start with a gallon of milk, um, and, and play around with that and see how that feels. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, the other topic on this particular, um, slide was what if you can't see your feet? So I, I wanted to make that be, um, a separate topic. So I, I think this is a real challenge for people. So uh, the typical way that we gaze when we walk is we're looking about 12 feet or 12 to 15 feet in front of us, scanning the ground when we're walking. So that's how you know, oh, I'm a, there is a crack in the sidewalk up ahead or there's a banana peel. And then when you come up to it, a two or two or three strides later, um, you already know where it is. You might need to look again. Um, often you don't need to look down. It is uh, very understandable why somebody with lower extremity with a leg limb loss looks down, right? That's a habit initially. Where is my foot? So people are looking down to figure out where their foot is for quite a while and, and getting somebody to stop always doing that. It doesn't mean you never should, uh, but always relying on that. Look ahead instead of down. Uh, that's, a, that's a little nerve wracking. When you look ahead, when you gaze, it also, again, makes you a little bit more upright. Instead of when you look down, people will look down with their head and then their whole body looks down. <laughs> So that, that's really where it messes with people to carry something. So very often in, in therapy sessions, uh, when I was working in the clinic, I would have my folks practice when they were to the point where they could walk without a device and they were early in that process, but I would have them carry one of those big exercise balls. So what I liked about that is it's lightweight. I don't want them to carry something heavy but it was a little awkward, it's big, and they can't see their feet. And it makes somebody really, really think about what their core is doing, what my legs are doing, where my feet are. Uh, so, you know, I think it's worth practicing, but again, in a, in a safe environment. Uh, so what does everybody have to add to that? Brooke, do you have something you want to add to that? <clears throat> I don't because I struggle to carry something when I can't see my feet. So I can't imagine like, you know, like I, and, and the only thing I can relate it to, sorry, the only thing I can relate it to is having a mask on, right? It is so crazy to know that, like how much that's changed my balance. Like with my mask on, if I'm hustling, to get up the stairs, especially at work. And I've got like something in my hands. Like I cannot tell you how many times I've almost face planted it like up three stairs. So I can't imagine what that feels like as an amputee, but just know the face masks have given me a firsthand experience at what your life might be like. And have you guys found that even adding the mask has changed it for you guys even more? Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's maybe some uh, just because I wear glasses and you got the whole foggy thing going on, you know, when I was out. But I am one that wants to see my feet pretty much 99.999% of the time and where I'm going. So if you ever see me carrying something in the store like a tub, it's because somebody has a gun pointed to my head because <laughs> I just do not feel comfortable with that, with not seeing where mm -hmm. I'm going and what my step is doing. Um, and they have carts in stores. So I'm going to take my husband if I need to do something that is, caring. So I am not one that would probably um, be carrying something like that. Uh, Mark and I talked about this prior 
uh, to this evening is I want to know, I want to have enough reaction time mm -hmm. to, to see, you know, what's in front of me. And because walking on an even ground, like in our yard and stuff, I can't see those divots. So every once in a while, those surprise me too. And I don't have anything in my hand. So, you know, my, I always think, oh my gosh, if I had, you know, a ton of flowers in my hand, I probably would have fallen, you know, mm -hmm. because I, I couldn't, didn't have time to react to that. And that's mm -hmm. why I pull a wagon with my garden supplies in the Nice. The yard, so. I like so it. I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to give you any good answers on how to do that because it's it's something that I choose not to do, I guess. Well, I think you gave us a good answer and that is avoid it if you're not comfortable. And, and that, you know, I think that one of the reasons to bring this up is for a newer amputee to be a little bit more aware because what you don't want is that you, you're in this situation and you can't, and there you are and you're stuck and you weren't able to plan in advance. So maybe this conversation helps somebody plan a little bit. Lori, have you been able to do that at all? Have you messed with that or have you been avoiding that too? I avoid it. <laughs> yeah, I avoid it. <laughs> That's yep. okay. If I can't I see my finger, I'm going to walk probably. <laughs> I don't yeah, think there's that's, any shame sorry. in that game if you're trying to keep yourself sane. That, I mean, that's kind of my motto. Yes. Oh, I completely agree. Mark, you probably do it, though. Yeah, I, I do do it. Um, but as far as, like, the mask, changing my perception of where, where things are, I'm not really affected by it. But I think that comes from my years of being involved in motorcycles and having a helmet around my face. Okay. So as long as I can see something, I'm, I'm generally all right. But I mean, you take away your, your sight from out here. So I can't see three feet in front of me. I slow down. Um, I usually take shorter steps depending on what I'm carrying. If it's something heavy, yes, I'm taking shorter steps, but I'm also, it's almost like you're walking around in the dark. You're kind of searching for that wall or that, coffee table thing so when you do kick it you don't kick it as hard and break your toe um so it's you're more deliberate in how you're walking and where you're where you're thinking about going um again i think it comes back to my experience with motorcycles i always look as far ahead as possible so i have a rough idea of where what's in between where i want to go and where i'm at but i'm still cautious of what if something somebody runs out in front of me or a cat runs out of the, the hallway and jumps in front of me? Mm -hmm. Which is a real thing at your house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a child, yeah, a cat, funny. they're the same thing. A dog. <laughs> it's funny as we kind of transition into the last slide, hearing everyone say like, I avoid it. I avoid it is actually the number one response that like when Brooke, Renee and I send out feelers, to patients when we're doing a video project or anything that has to do with community reintegration. We say, hey, what do you do when you do this? Or what do you do when you do this? The number one response is, I don't. <laughs> I don't do that, right? <laughs> Sipped through dozens of emails where it's like, I just avoid it. So there's nothing wrong with that by any means. Um, as much as we love teaching patients how to do something, there is no shame in just saying, I just don't. I don't know if I did it when I had two legs, two real legs. Uh -huh. I mean, to be honest with you, I just don't know that I I did that a whole lot. Mm -hmm. so. No, that's fair. So uh, lastly, now you have uh, navigated your way around the grocery and you've selected all of the stuff that you wanted, um, including those impulse buys in the checkout lane. You got to check out, you got to pay for your stuff. So, um, so regular, you know, so I think one of the biggest things for me from a lower extremity perspective is static standing, prolonged standing, waiting in a line, uh, even if you've got a cart there to lean on, that can, uh, that can really be a surprise because if you think about other times in your life, when you're standing still, it doesn't happen very often from a prolonged perspective. It's a relatively rare occurrence. Maybe if you're cooking, 
you're, you know, you're standing in the kitchen and you might sidestep here and there and be doing some things, but you're not stuck there. So, uh, so that can be problematic for people. That's again, where I like people to be working on their core strength. I, I think twisting rotation is really important. Some prosthetic legs have a built-in allowance for a twist. So your, your regular ankle has some twisting component to it. There's a tiny bit of rotation component at your knee. Most of the rotation comes from your hip and your, and your low back, but there's still some of it that happens in your leg. And if your prosthesis doesn't have any of that rotation component and you try to have your foot planted and turn your body, you're going to get pressure in the socket on your, on your residual limb. And that's going to be pretty uncomfortable. So I really recommend that you pick your feet up. So where your face is facing, that's where your feet should be facing. So imagine that you're at the checkout at the right, at the regular checkout lane. I think I might be standing in front of my cart. I might've pulled my cart in behind me, maybe sidestepped reach in, take something, put it on. I might be reaching sideways, but not doing this rotation thing over and over again. Um, that's, that's one option. I'll, I'll be curious to hear what everybody says about that. And then we want to make sure that we talk about self checkout, um, because that adds another wrinkle, right? I find, I do a lot of self checkout. And so I find that I'm, uh, rotating a lot and you're in a weird space, right? You kind of push your card in and it's, you know, it, you don't want to be um, impeding somebody else. And so you might be twisting at a, at an awkward angle. Uh, so I'd like to hear um, what everybody has to say about that, about checking out any tips or tricks that you have. I'm going to tell you Renee that um since you've spoke, there are two points that I think you make that are wonderful points that I go through each time I'm in the checkout. And I thought maybe it was only me. So for you to voice that means that other folks have the same complications, I guess, is that when you are waiting in a, a checkout line, my residual, that that is harder on me than walking through the store for two hours. It mm. is just that standing there waiting and not that I have to do it often, but when I do, it's, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, is this never going to stop? So mm. I applaud to you because I really did think about that today. Um, and another thing I think that you said earlier in the, um, the, this this meeting was the sidestepping because I have to go if I'm by myself from front to back in a narrow aisle way. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I do have that car in order to, there is some stability to know that you have a car that, that's there by your side, but you got to watch wheels and you got to watch, you know, the um, counter right here and, and whatever, but I have to go front to back to get all of my groceries out. So I think that, that that's a good point that you make that, you know, to practice that side locking, but I think it is also very viable that at least for me, and again, I have the lower is that just standing there mm -hmm. um, is, is, harder on me than walking around the whole store a lot of times. So I think mm -hmm. that point you bring up um, mm -hmm. is something that I thought maybe it was only me who felt that way. So you gave validation to that. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for that. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Lori? Um, I generally do not use the self-checkout just because I then have to, I have to handle the groceries twice. I have to, I have to take them out of my cart, scan them, bag them, and put them back in my cart. So that's just problematic for me. I generally stand in line, even though standing in line is hard. Um, yeah, you do get you get tired, and legs sore, and um, mm -hmm. so I just I just prefer to use to have them check me out. Mm 
then I only have to handle the groceries once to unload them from the cart and put them in the car. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, how about you? Um, I generally just pick whatever is quicker. Um, but that doesn't mean I have to stay in there in line because sometimes there's a line at self checkout. Sometimes there's a line at the, the standard checkout line. So, um, my big thing is, uh, just trying to be patient with it. Um, I'll agree with Chris. I'd much rather walk around somewhere than just stand. Um, it's, um, not that standing is uncomfortable. It's just, I'm more conscious of standing than I am walking of what I have to do. Um, and balance. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, it also occurred to me, I talked a bunch about sidestepping, but what about practicing walking backwards, which is pretty great practice as well. Um, and it's harder for the, um, you know, for somebody like Lori with an above knee amputation, uh, but practicing stepping, even if you're just taking a couple steps backward, if you're pulling your cart toward you, for example, uh, can can really help with uh, with your general mobility. Mm-hmm. I practice um, a any, lot. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I, I did in my kitchen, just going from one counter to another, mm-hmm. doing backwards. So yeah, that's good. I think it's helpful. Mm-hmm. So uh, is the, I think that's um, our last official topic, right, Theron? So anything that's else correct. that you would want to add about checkout? I, I just, I know, like, I always feel rushed, you know, like, I always feel like when it's my turn, right, to get my groceries out, um, I always just feel rushed, or I feel like there's tons of eyes um, on me to like, you know, hustle. And I see now too, again, just totally calling out Kroger. Um, they have, I don't know if you've all seen them, but they have these little triangles that indicate like green, yellow, or red, or where the cashier is as far as their speed of, of swiping your groceries. And so I wonder if you guys like, do you feel pressure to like, hustle and you know everybody's got their eyes on me like I just think I think of things so many times from an upper limb perspective and they have such a hard time going out to the grocery because they feel like everybody's just staring um so do you ever feel like that like do you feel like the hustle in the checkout line that you're like I gotta I gotta get this done because somebody's looking at me or I just am not fast enough I think you'll get better with that as you get older. <laughs> you don't care as much anymore about what other people think. <laughs> my, I am looking forward to that day. <laughs> my, my big thing is if I've got to wait in line on you to bag your groceries, you're going to wait on me. So yep. I'm yep. going to take my time. I like it. That's, that's good. <laughs> And I, like I, I stated before, I'm retired, so I tend to go on days that um, there's just a bunch of old ladies like me there at the grocery store, and they don't care anyway. We're, we're striking out conversation, so that's right. I, I have never, and if I did feel pressured, I probably wouldn't even care then, because mm-hmm. I'm like Mark. I waited on the woman or man before me, so they can kind of wait on me. Yeah. Earlier today in our prep meeting, Renee asked Chris, so what time is that, that you go shopping? And she was saying it to make it sound like for, you know, research for this. I think that's when she's going to start shopping. Like, we're going to start <laughs> to see, like, like doctor's appointment in her schedule, like, at 2 yeah, o'clock exactly. on a Wednesday. <laughs> I have an appointment. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, if I see somebody videotaping me at the grocery store, I am, I am calling you, Theron. I'm just. <laughs> hey, you, you're going to turn around. You're going to see Brooke in that aisle probably the next time you go there. That's right. So. That's right. So for the last few minutes, um, I will not put you on the spot if you don't want to be, but we do have two guests who have joined us. Um, so I'll give you guys just a little bit of time if you would like to either put a question in the chat. If you'd like to unmute yourself and turn your camera on, again, because we're recording, that is 100% your choice. 
Um, but please do feel free that if you have a question, again, chat or um, unmute yourself and ask, um, and then just give you guys just a couple seconds here to decide if you'd like to do that or not. And then while we're um, waiting for anybody to chime in, did we miss any topics uh, related to shopping that, that anything that you all would want to pass on to our listeners? Uh, one thing that I found for my very first shopping trip by myself um, after my amputation, I failed to consider the fact that there was an incline coming out of our Kroger store mm. and I have a heavy cart mm -hmm. and I'm not too steady on my feet yet. So here I have this cart and I'm, ah! I have to get down this little hill and it might might as well have been Mount Everest it was huge to me so I just kind of pulled back as far as I could and let the cart kind of pull me down and I, I went as slowly as I could but that was very awkward and it was scary so oh. and I, I don't know of a way to overcome that but now I'm prepared for that incline but yeah mm -hmm. Lori, that's such a great point because I think sometimes, right, people think that, oh my gosh, I'm going to go to the store and all is well. So I don't know too, like, would it make sense for us as therapists to say to the patients, hey, like do a dry run, right? Get in your car and drive around the perimeter of the store. Like just take a peruse through the parking lot, right? How far is it that, you know, I think I'm going to have to walk is there that incline, right? Like, I think we just go and we don't kind of problem solve or pre-plan some of that stuff. So that's an awesome point that I would love to tell patients now is, hey, go drive around, like take a Sunday drive to the Scope grocery out. store, but don't go in. Just like check out the situation and see what you're getting yourself into so that you can pre-plan some of that stuff and ask those questions because I think we find too many times patients get themselves into a situation and they're doing some split second problem solving that can make those situations pretty scary. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really good one, Lori. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alma. How are you? Hi. Hey. I'm so, I was working a puzzle and had my phone on mute until I didn't miss my alarm. So <laughs> <laughs> no sorry problem. about that. No problem. Did you have a question? Well, I was just going to comment that I don't know how long before y'all started grocery shopping, but I'm still using a walker with my above the knee prosthesis. Mm -hmm. And so I have a friend that grocery shops for me, but I went with her one day and I'd only walked for maybe 15 minutes before a distance. And here I walked an hour and a half through the whole Meyer store. And I was so sore for the next few days. But what I did was pick up a few items at a time and put them on my seat of my walker and then put them in her cart. But by the time it came to checkout, I had to sit. <laughs> so I bet you I did. So tired. So I'm just wondering how soon, like Lori has above knee amputation, did you start actually grocery shopping or? I got my prosthesis last April. I was probably grocery shopping by May. Wow. But it, it wasn't, you know, like I say, it wasn't a good situation. I, I kicked the wheel of the cart multiple times and it probably wasn't terribly safe. <laughs> so it, yeah, I should have taken somebody with me the first couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, are you I, walking I, without? Are you walking without aid to go grocery shopping? Or I, I, I cane to get into the store. My husband wants me to use a cane if I'm outside, so I do. I fell and broke my leg. Um, just mm -hmm. almost a year into getting my my prosthesis, so then I was without it for several months. So, um, yeah that was a whole new experience, but so I use my cane to get into the store and then I use the cart. Okay. But I can walk without my cane. Mm -hmm. Just not outside. No at all. <laughs> I'm in my third prothesis and I've walked out of two of them. So it's, 
And now I have the type that was oh. molded to my leg, you know, that type of prosthesis. So, and I'm still sore from the surgery because they pulled out so much metal. Yeah. Still hurts to touch the end of oh, my, my residual mm -hmm. limb. So, mm -hmm. you know, after mm -hmm. six or seven, eight hours, you know, I've had it with the prosthesis. And Can uh, you? I bet. Can you put one of those little, um, are you driving Alma? No, I haven't. Cause okay. you know, it's my right leg. It's your right leg. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because if you, you know, if you happen to be at the store without your, your good friend, you know, I've seen a lot of people put the, the carry basket. You can't get that many groceries, but on the seat, if they have a rollator walker. Oh, that's a good idea. So yeah. if you just need a few things and somebody drops you off or they're doing their own shopping and you just need, you know, you just sit that basket. Um, and obviously if you, work. Yeah. And you only have a little basket, you're not going to spend an hour and a half in Meyer. Right. <laughs> check out and then you go sit on the bench and <laughs> for your buddy. <clears throat> But even just that amount of walking, you know, it doesn't have to be an hour and a half, but that's a phenomenal, that's excellent exercise. So I'm good for you for doing that. And I'm glad you had somebody who could take you. Thank you. I'll, I'll say that's probably the grocery store was the furthest I walked um, post prosthetic, like first time. I mean, cause I, I come in and I do therapy and we, we'd walk in there, but it wasn't walking all the time. But when you say an hour and a half of walking, you don't realize how much that is until you walk that amount. And then, mm -hmm. like you said, you were sore and you're tired for the next couple of days. So mm -hmm. um, it's something you don't think about until you actually do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I'm walking outside now with my walker, you know, on the sidewalk on the pretty days. And that's helping, you know. Oh, good. I'm trying to build up. <laughs> good for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for chiming in, Alma. And I'll make sure that you get a link once this is up on YouTube so you can see the first part of this as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Brooke, I'll, anything that we, since we've, we've had both Lori and Chris kind of chime in with last minute comments, anything from your perspective? Don't that do what Chris does. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do what I do. Um, no, I just, you know, I have to say like, kudos to all of you like it's so cool um and I I just I don't know I always get so inspired and it's so fun to listen to what you guys do because this is Renee and I's life and this is what we do every day um and it's still so fun to hear your guys's tips and tricks and I just have to say too, I think you're so incredibly brave. Um, I can't imagine what it is like to be out in this big, bad world um, with the prosthesis. So just know, like, I'm so proud of all of you and y'all are killing it. And thank you for being so candid and, and sharing your ideas um, because it really, truly is, is going to help somebody else. And whether or not you think that you're an inspiration to somebody, there's going to be somebody who's going to watch this and you're going to change their life. So thank you. Well, Absolutely. thanks for letting me me get back to you guys. I mean, you guys have been wonderful and this was just such a wonderful thing that I'm able to give back to help you guys. I don't know how good I help, but. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, You're did we forget anything or are we good? No, I just, I want the take home message, I think for all of our listeners to be um, that there is no one answer. There's no one solution. Mm -hmm. so take all the advice you can get, try it, try it again, try something different. Um, ask as many people as you can. Don't be afraid to talk to your therapist. <laughs> you see a theme. Um, so yeah, we're, we just want you to be encouraged more than anything else. So thanks to our panelists for, for contributing this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you for holding this. I appreciate it. Even though I'm late getting in. No, you're good. Alma. You're it's fine. Good to see you. And, though, and to conclude, for anyone who's watching this on YouTube in the future, you will see in the description um, contact information for all of our panelists, in particular, Brooke Renee um, and Mark. And it does not matter where in the United States that you are viewing this from. We are actually um, 
partners with a lot of different clinics throughout the United States. And so if you are in need of help, whether on the prosthetic side, the therapy side, or just one of those patients who we hear time after time saying, I wish someone would have told me fill in the blank, we are here to help you. So never hesitate to reach out to us. Um, thank you so much to my SRT team and very much thank you to our patient panelists for joining us this evening. Thank you for what you do and what you're gonna do for helping others. And I just hope everyone has a fantastic evening. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody, yep. good night. Bye folks. Bye.